Have you ever wondered what it'd be like if Pokemon were a horror game? Because that's what Evertale advertises itself as. And admittedly, that's about as far from accurate as you can get. Hey, my name is Styx, and welcome to the very first episode of Worst Gacha Ever, a video series where we play through every single gacha game and analyze what the game does right and what it does wrong. If you enjoyed this series, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that little bell notification to remain updated with every new episode. Before we go any further though, I do want to give a quick shout out to all of our patrons over on Patreon. While this channel is technically monetized due to the nature of a lot of the content, Patreon allows for me to at least make something off of these videos, so kudos guys, you guys rock. Evertale is publicly known to advertise itself as something that it isn't. You'll find advertisements all over the internet attempting to trick potential players into believing that this is in fact a horror-esque Pokemon game. On the contrary, the game is a very light-hearted, cute anime RPG with little frog people with furries and a whole lot of booba, <laughs> literally so much booba. Upon logging into the game, they remind you of all of the booba that you have not yet spent money failing to obtain. Every boss fight in the Tower of Trials consists of scantily clad women. The most overpowered characters that you can recruit channel the power of booba to grow even more powerful. And while I've played quite a few gacha games recently, I dare say this is the most blatant use of over-sexualization in an attempt to convince players to spend money that I've seen yet. Evertale revolves around generic RPG hero number 642, Finn, a kind, compassionate, brown-haired sword fighter that also happens to be a human magnet for the hottest women on the planet. Finn is a weak, completely useless three-star character. When beginning the game, I was of the impression that I should attempt to max out his level to boost him, to equip him with the best gear I could obtain, because he's the main character. Evidently, he's going to be an important, integral part of every team composition, right? They always are. But boy was I wrong. Finn is a three-star character, and no matter what you do to him, no matter what happens to him in-game, Finn remains a three-star character. There is no ascending him to a higher class, a higher quality, meaning that he's restricted to being level 30, he has no access to mastery, no potential limit breaks, no awakenings, no potential at all. He's one of the most useless characters that you will come across, period. And I wish I'd known this at the start before wasting so much time and effort into various three-star characters that I'd recruited. You know, if it were a female main character, she'd have a slew of upgrades, she'd have alternate outfits, anything to incentivize players to spend money to keep her relevant. Now let's talk about your units real quick. By selecting the units tab, you'll have access to the forge, to your inventory, to mercenaries, your battalion, the power up section, fellowship, and story team. The forge is pretty self-explanatory. You can convert your characters, duplicates you don't want to use to awaken heroes into items. Your inventory thus far seemed more or less useless to me. I don't know. Uh, you can, I guess, use it to keep track of how many of which item you have, I guess. Mercenaries are heroes that you own, that you can equip and then select, allowing your friends to use them if and when they need. Your battalion lets you create various different platoons, each with their own characters, weapons, accessories. Platoons are used as an example for content like the Tower of Trials. 
you can upgrade your characters using the power up tab. You can awaken them, you can boost them, you can increase their potential, limit break them, level them up and increase their mastery, providing beneficial elemental advantages. You can do more or less the exact same thing for your weapons with the exception of mastery, providing a surplus of options to increase your hero's statistics across the board. The fellowship gives you advantages dependent on how many times each hero has been awakened and finally, you have the story team. This is where you form your group to tackle the main narrative of the game with. You select your party composition, you equip them with weapons, you equip them with accessories, and then you just jump straight in to the main story. The narrative that you follow isn't bad, it's a fairly basic RPG story, one that I'll admit really didn't retain my attention for too long. You're thrown into a linear world straight out of a JRPG from the 90s, there's no overworld, but you do possess full control over your character at all times. You move through a variety of different areas, each with their own unique aesthetic. Desert, snowy mountains, forests, weird uh, other dimensional rifts in space and time. Each area had grass that you could encounter monsters within, like in Pokemon, you run into the grass and after several steps you encounter an enemy that takes you into a separate instanced encounter window. You don't catch these monsters that you engage out in the wild though. Rather, you encounter NPCs out in the world, via the story and through summoning. Those are characters, those are monsters that you can recruit. Each area is connected via a town. You move from town to town, with each town consisting of two screens in total. The initial load-in, a short horizontal map that leads you to a building on the far right, and then a building where you talk to the NPC that takes you to the next zone, which leads you to the next town. And, <laughs> Well, that pretty much sums up the entire game, more or less. The narrative pushes you through to new areas that are blocked off until you visit the town and unlock them. You can buy weapons in towns, but they were just so vastly inferior to what I obtained through summoning that I really didn't bother. Summoning is where you'll become unbelievably frustrated with the game and come to realize that you're honestly probably better off wasting your time and money in something else. Gotcha rates from what I found online come in at a mere 1% for SSR units. I'm almost level 80 as of recording this, having played it for the last two weeks straight, and I have thus far acquired not a single SSR character. Googling around, the sentiment seems to more or less mirror my own. The rates are horrible. Having low rates doesn't incentivize me to spend more money to not obtain the characters I want. On the contrary, it makes me feel like it would be a waste of my money and instead turn me away from spending anything on it because I know how unlikely it would be for me to successfully obtain what I want. This might not necessarily be as bad if there were a pity system in place, but there isn't, which means that you're not guaranteed an SSR character, ever. You can go weeks, months, years, and not obtain a single high rarity unit. But I mean, they definitely know how to appeal to their player base. Looking through all the banners available, all you see are hot waifu bait. Every time you log into the game, they just throw these hot waifus in your face, as if that'll influence your, uh, hey, what, what, are, what are you doing? No, don't, don't give in to that temptation. C Come on, man. Now, outside of pursuing the main story, you have a selection of activities to partake of via the Battalion Warfare function. War of the Realms, uh, well, actually, no, wait, that's locked. Alliance quests, which our alliance is too low level to really do anything with. I probably shouldn't have been randomly clicking join on every alliance that I saw. The Tower of Trials, which is a mode that auto battles waves of enemies for you. Every minute you accumulate currency and XP that you obtain by clicking the chest in the middle of the screen. You can use the exploration feature to obtain additional rewards. You can also fast forward to obtain even more rewards atop of those, totaling an exorbitant amount of resources. And most importantly, you can challenge tower bosses. I made it to floor 57 before hitting a wall and being unable to progress any further. At that juncture, the cute little schoolgirl there absolutely stomped on me, um, stepped on me, I mean, stomped me. And I'm not saying that, you know, that was necessarily entirely against what happened. I mean, look at her, <laughs> but 
she made it look like the first 56 floors were an introductory tutorial. The arena is, uh, well, it's a mode where you deploy your units to auto-engage other players' units in auto-PVP. I'd say it requires skill and strategy, but that would be a blatant lie. There are raids present, but even at almost 3,000 combat power, I was far too low to participate. There's a training dojo. Ad admittedly, I, I didn't really do anything with this as I didn't really have an affinity with my Charizard. I know Ash would be so disappointed in me, but you know what? Every new season, he ditched his Pokemon, so I feel as though he has no room to talk. You're given a, a pre-selected team, and you have to defeat enemies to obtain currency and items to awaken your pet if you still use it, which I don't, so again, it felt a little bit useless for me to really invest time into. And finally, there are events, things like the Day of Dragonfire, like Kiss of the Vicious Rose, Grove of Wishes. These were events that were going on as I was recording footage anyway. Each event consists of a story associated with it and a sequence of battles one after the other, what you'd expect, honestly. Do I have to mention that there are dailies as well because <sighs> There are dailies. Use X amount of mana, fast forward, fight in the arena, win an alliance quest. Completing daily missions earns you additional currency, so you can upgrade your heroes and your weapons further. You'd have daily login bonuses to incentivize logging in, well, daily, and uh, that's about it. I invested two weeks into Evertail. After seeing advertisements for it everywhere online, depicting it as some type of horror Pokemon, I was intrigued. It turns out that it was merely false advertising in an attempt to sell itself as something that it wasn't. And that was the first red flag. Graphically, Evertail actually looked pretty damn good. Waifus looked fantastic, environments looked detailed, there was enough in terms of varied biomes that it always felt like you were genuinely in different areas of the world. Combat was manual exclusive for story battles along with NPC battles you'd encounter out in the world, which I appreciated. Auto combat was activated for random encounters or for grinding, the Tower of Trials and other less important game modes. There was a lot to do with plenty of reasons to continue to log in daily. However, with its horrendous lack of pity and gacha rates, it's such a terrible experience that becomes progressively more difficult as you begin to realize that you are highly inhibited by your team of heroes that would be so much more powerful had they just implemented a pity system in the first place. Is Evertail the worst gacha game of 2022? Hardly. They have a shady, underhanded, downright scammy approach to advertising, which is an issue that I found immediately, and that alone is cause for me to never recommend this game to anyone, and other than its rates and lack of pity, it's actually a fairly average game. If you're struggling to find a game to play, a game to look forward to this year, then I have you covered. Here is a list of every upcoming gacha game of 2022, and let me tell you, it's looking to be a pretty sick year.